Hey, everybody, welcome to another special episode of the Fantasy Feeds podcast meets the Indie Fantasy Addicts group. Today, we've got some awesome things to talk about. We're talking audiobooks. I don't know about you, but I love audiobooks. I got into them five, six years ago, and I am totally hooked. So today we have Travis. How do you pronounce your last name? Baldry. Baldry. Awesome audiobook narrator. Jeff, writer of said book to be turned into audio, right? Unless you yeah. do your own audio book, Jeff. I, I should have put my last name when I typed it in, right? Right. Yeah. Shut Jeff. The yeah. There's, There's only one Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. There. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Just Je the Jeff. Yep, the Jeff. That would be great. So we've got a couple more guests who are supposed to be coming on, maybe some technical difficulties. We'll see what happens. If nothing else, we're going to have a fun hour talking about audiobooks. So Travis, seeing as you're kind of the expert here, tell us a little bit about how you got into audiobooks. Let's see. So I've been doing audiobooks for a couple of years now. I'm not an old hand like, like a lot of the other narrators that you'll run into, but I've been doing it for a while. Um, I'm actually normally a game developer. That's my main job and has been for decades and i got this sound booth so that we could do uh uh we could do recording for vo without having to rent out studio space and uh my kids didn't need me to read stories in to them anymore and i've done a lot of game vo kind of historically so i stumbled across acx and i started doing it and i really 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 liked it and so i kept doing it um and um i've just had such a blast doing it it's just so it's so enjoyable. And I have a cool job. People want my job. I make games. Everybody wants to make games. But I actually like this job better. It's so cool. So, um, and uh, after doing that for a few years, I've gotten to the point where books just pretty much constantly come my way and I have cool stuff to read all the time and I just couldn't be happier about it. That's pretty awesome. So uh, I'm I'm guessing you're kind of a book guy. You like books. I love books. I love books. And I think it's probably pretty useful to be, as an audiobook narrator to really like language in books. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. What what would you say is your favorite genre? Like if you had to gun to your head. Oh man, you really you are putting a gun to my head. <laughs> um I really like things that straddle genres. Okay. You know, you look at something like uh, Stephen King, like the, the Dark Tower cycle. It's is it fantasy? Kinda. Is it horror? A little. Is it sci-fi? Yes. I love those mixes, and those are often some of my most favorite books. That's um, but that's just I guess that's that's genre fiction, I guess, is what you could say. Yeah. The genre fiction. I mean, it's what it's what we write, so it's what this yeah. podcast is about. So exactly. we get it. <laughs> Now, now, Jeff, from the other side of things, you are an audiobook consumer, I assume. Uh, I am. And also, I'm, you know, author. And, and actually, Travis has been narrating my new series. The the Sworn Guardian one? No, no, no that, oh, that's TL's. Minor oh. The Wizardoms series? Right, of course. Uh, apologies for that. <laughs> that one. Right, the Wizardoms. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Right? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Well, so, so seeing as we're talking about audiobooks, I guess, how, how long have you been listening to audiobooks? Uh, actually, I kind of just got into listening to them this year, mostly because um, I have another series that's published through Podium. And, uh, you know, that was a, like a low risk way for me to get some books into it. And then I decided to uh, go ahead and, you know, do it directly myself through ACX and, you know, find a narrator who was talented and could bring my books to life. And, you know, so I, I just got into it all at the same time as my books got into it. That's pretty cool. You know, I, so I got into audiobooks like seven or eight years ago. I was living in Mexico City at the time, and I lived in the south of the city. We're talking the biggest city in the world, right? Oh, yeah. So I lived in the south of the city. I had to drive across town, town being, you know, an hour away with no traffic to get to my, my first English class in the morning. And then I would have to drive from the north to the west to get to my next class and then, of course, get home. So I would spend, like on the bad days, I would spend up to six hours in traffic. Good. On and a single day. On a single day. Oh, oh yeah. Horrible. Good God. Yeah, I would, I, would leave, I would leave the house at 5 a.m. to get where I need to go to cross the city before traffic. So I hated that. I hated that. And then I found an audiobook somewhere. And I had always hated audiobooks before just because – I couldn't pay attention to it. It just didn't work for my brain and, and all of that. And I was like, it's just not going to work for me. But then I literally had no choice. I had nothing better to do. So I started listening to audiobooks, and, and I think it like 
it was just the perfect time. And until it was like, I looked forward to sitting in traffic because, you know, I'd be at some big epic climactic scene in the book. And I'm like, no, I don't want to get out and go teach English. I want to be sitting <laughs> in traffic so I can keep listening to this awesome thing. And so I think in the year and a half that I taught English, I consumed maybe 40 to 60 audiobooks, but wow. like, you know, epic doorstoppers, not just the, you know, not the, the, the regular length sci-fi stuff, but, you know, like 200, 300,000 word books because I just had so much time and, and I've been totally hooked. Now I can't run with music. I listen to audiobooks while I run. I work out with audiobooks. I drive with audiobooks, you know, like everything, every chance that I get, I listen to it because it's just so, it's just so great to be able to read without having to sit there and look at yep. At what I'm doing, my wife and I got into audiobooks. I don't know, 18 years ago, something like that, <laughs> when they still came on cassettes, and ah, you know, yeah. a good percentage of them were abridged, which sucked. Yeah. We always hated that, um, and we were so happy when they started putting them on CDs. And we ended up, we drove a lot as well. Um, and then as they moved to CVs, I had family that's in Texas, so we would have to do these cross country drives from Washington down to Texas, which is a, a long ass drive. <laughs> um, and so we listened to a lot of Stephen King, The Green Mile you know, uh, Black House. Um, and Frank Muller did a lot of the narrations for those. And Frank Muller is still one of my favorite narrators of all time. I think he's just spectacular. So we listened to tons of that. And then eventually we ended up listening to a lot of the Jim Dale Harry Potters. My wife had problems going to sleep. And so she would put on the CD of the Harry Potter series, all of the freaking books, and she would play them at night. So I listened to Jim Dale reading Harry Potter for literally years, literally years. I can I can hear his voice in my mind right now. I know the little jingle of the audio at the beginning. Um, <laughs> we went on like a very belated honeymoon to Italy. And because she knew she would have trouble sleeping, we literally drug a CD player and two small speakers. And Harry Potter was played at every freaking hotel all across <laughs> Italy. That is awesome. And and it's great now that, you know, with, with Audible, ACX, all of that, you can just get stuff oh out of your phone. Not having to haul those CDs around is right. <laughs> even it's even better than not having to haul around, you know, that collection of books. Yep. It's like, it just keeps getting better and better. Now it's just one little device and, and we're good. Um, so I have to ask Travis, obviously you're, you're partial to yourself as the, as the voice talent to beat, but who do you, who do you look up to as like, like the the best in in the industry for the genres the speculative fiction genres that you work in oh there's so many good narrators i mean you've got ray porter he's amazing nick padel uh uh luke daniels um uh tim campbell's reading reading your other series for podium isn't he jeff yep love yeah, tim's work um rc bray is of course everybody loves rc bray um there's just there's a ton of really great narrators um tend to get a lot of books from people who couldn't get Nick Padel. <laughs> like I asked Nick and he was too busy for the next year. Would you like to read this? So I, <laughs> in fact, I was thinking of getting a shirt for the next audiobook conference that said Nick Padel could not be here. And I was just going <laughs> to walk around with that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You know, the, all of those guys that you mentioned, they're kind of like the newer talents when you know, like, like I, I, I was thinking uh, probably my favorite audiobook narrators have to be Michael Kramer. Who's fantastic? And I we think his name is Mike Michael Pope, who did the 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 Gentleman Bastard series, or Michael Page, maybe. I don't he's, know. If I, I'm, he's I'm not. Sure a, if I hear his voice, I will recognize him. But yeah, he's not as well known, I think. But but the the like the version he did for the the, the Gentleman Bastard series, his vo his transitions between voices and each of the voices, like they were they were so seamless. Yeah. Do you do you have a hard time with the transitions? How do you do that? Um. I, I, that's the part of that that I love. I love the actual acting and character voice part and thinking about yeah. the timing and the transition. And there's there's lots of weird. So there's like the, the hang time between the delivery of the dialogue and a specific accent and then like the attribution. Yeah. And a lot of times the attribution is like a throwaway. You kind of want to lapse into it because you don't want to draw attention to it. Who cares that they said he said, you know, he said it because yeah. I just said yeah. it. <laughs> so there's this sort of like, Tight, like microsecond period of slop where you're kind of transitioning from the voice into the attribution. And I kind of love it because it sort of smooths out that transition and lets you throw away the attribution as almost part of the, 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 the music of the actual delivery of the dialogue. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm alone in that, but I've always, I never really like a big gap between the attributions. You have the voice and then it sounds like someone from another room says, he said. 
So do you do you do it kind of straight through? I try to I try to make it part of the same delivery of the line where the attribution is almost a continuation of the actual dialogue. Not in a, not in an overt way. I mean, I don't want it to feel like that character is saying it, but there's just that subtlety of transition that I like that I think makes that feel kind of of a piece. Interesting. Do you ever drop the he said, she said, like if they're not important? No, nope. nope. I always say if the word is on the page, I try to respect yeah. it and put it in there. You I know? was going to ask that. And, you know, sometimes you get um, like a series where you only have two people talking to each other. Right. So uh, like authors drop the dialogue tags. Right. So it's him, then her, then him, then her. Like just wondering if that's challenging or you just switch. I points. love that. I okay. love that because I like my, my goal for me. I feel like there's a couple of approaches to audiobooks, right? You have the one where Morgan Freeman is sitting in the chair reading the story to you, and you're you're like, oh, I'm sitting here, and Morgan Freeman is reading the story to me. And there's the one where it's like a mental movie, and all this yeah. stuff is happening. And that's what I want personally as an audiobook consumer. I want that mental movie, and I want that rapid fire, like live feel to dialogue. So it feels like I'm listening to people talking. Um, so I actually like it when there's no attribution, as long as I can suss it out, and I should be able to suss it out. Um, I, I really appreciate that kind of like back and forth of the dialogue, especially since I like doing character voice. Um, it's my job to make it distinct and make it feel like something that's really happening. And I love it. Yeah. One thing that I've, that I have taken to doing, I guess for the last 15 books or so is instead of doing the, he said, she said, it's like, I, I do the character moves or, you know, like their expression or something. So it's like Bob looked angry and then there's the dialogue and then, yeah. Bob stood up. So it's like, instead of it being interrupted by he, he said, she said, it's like, there's sort of a natural ending to what right. they were saying. And then there's a movement and then they keep talking or something yeah. like that. That kind of and applied it, attribution that just gives yeah. you a little bit of stage direction and reinforces who's talking. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's yeah, it's important to do that, to mix it up. That's interesting. All right. So we've got one question from the audience. Do you have any suggestions or advice from choosing a narrator other than, you know, hire Travis, um, <laughs> any, any other, suggestions from either jeff or travis I, yeah i have some take it away um, okay so uh a fellow author who actually publishes a lot of books through um uh, audiobooks and he does really well recommended to me it's like yeah if you're going to go down this path and you're going to um you know like fund it yourself so you find a narrator and pay for it um you may have to pay more to get a narrator that has a following or is known in your genre, but it's worth it because they, people will listen to that narrator and they'll follow that narrator over to your books. So yes, I paid Travis more than I wanted to. <laughs> so, because, I appreciate it, Jeff. I appreciate he's it. Really talented, but he also has you know a, a great resume. Um, I mean, for instance, he narrated uh, Will White's um, Unsold, you know, the Cradle series. Nice. I mean, right away, like there's a great following as, and part of his resume to go with the talent. So, you know, it's worth it. When lucky for all of us, Audible Studios picked up that whole series and brought that all in-house to Audible Studios and started promoting it. So more eyeballs yeah. ended up on it than otherwise might have. Right. Now, how, do you find that people tend to follow you, Travis, as as much as they follow the books of the series? I think first and foremost, they follow the author, but people do look up books by narrator. And a lot of what I'll get in reviews if people like what I've done is I, I liked this. I really like the narrator. And I promptly went over and looked for other things that they've done because I want to keep listening to stuff and I enjoyed this experience. So what other stuff do they have that might intersect with what I like to read? So I know it happens. And because I can see it happen across reviews, I can say, oh, I, I listened to the Cradle series and I came over and found this and I really liked it. And that's great. Right. Right. I'm already seeing the same thing. And my first book with him just released like six weeks ago. Um, but I see the same thing. That's really interesting. And so I, I think this is one of those instances sort of where where you, in essence, almost have as much power or pull as, say, Jeff, who's done the work of actually writing the book. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't don't consider when going into audiobooks is that they they want to find someone who has that sort of, you know, selling power essentially as opposed to someone who just has the exact right voice and now that that right. that in a way that kind of diminishes your skill as a narrator which is not at all what it what it's supposed to sound like but it's like when a lot of people or a lot of first-time audiobook um 
creators, the, the authors, they go to the ACX, they look for, okay, I want this voice, right? And then they listen to four or five uh, auditions and they say, oh, I love this person's voice. It's, it's exactly what I envisioned in my head. And that's all that they factor in. Whereas if they had done a little bit more research, they said, okay, this person is 100% perfect, but they have no following versus this person who is 90, 95% perfect, but they have a bit of following. That right there, they still get a high quality product, but yeah. they also get the the saleability of it as well. I right. Think I think genre. it's very important by genre too, right? You yeah. want to find people that are in, that have some experience or, or titles in their genre. So like for romance, people really follow narrators, like a really? lot. It's my understanding more so than almost any other genre. They want, and so when authors of romance are looking for romance narrators, they want a narrator that already has a following. Um, I think this is definitely happens in, you look at lit RPG, people, mm -hmm. you, you, you get people like Jeff Hayes, you know, in Sound Booth Theater, people know what they're going to get. And so they're looking for more stuff that Sound, Sound Booth Theater is doing, you know, mm -hmm. um, people who listen to Luke Daniels and want, they know Luke Daniels is going to put out some more books that are in genres they like. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's, I wonder if that's as big of an effect in like broader kind of like literary circle. If you're just talking about, standard fiction for instance i wonder if that's as big of a deal in, or not i'd be curious hmm. to know i'm pretty sure in speculative fiction most speculative fiction genres that does have a lot to do with it you know I the mean, I totally i'm i'm i totally shot by narrator i don't want to listen to specific people reading me things really um, yeah yeah I, I i'm very specific by narrator <laughs> that's i see i always go for the book first because I want the story that you I care offer about. You. <laughs> I know. Well, no, but even even yeah. back when I was when I was listening to you know first getting into it before I started writing, I would listen to the books that I loved or that sounded interesting. Like before, we were talking about this one, uh, Tales of the Kin, this mm -hmm. audio book that I listened to. It should have been perfect. It was a thief slash assassin. You know, intrigue, vengeance, violence. You know, it's it's right up my alley. So I started listening to it, and and by the end of the book, I was like, I don't like this narrator, so the story was ruined for me. But I went into it for the story. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that's one thing that might be shifting a little bit, or maybe some people do it and I don't do it. I always go for the story, and then if the narrator's good, it makes the story worth it. Um, like I'm listening to one right now, um, Malice by John Gwynn. And from what I understand, people people love the book or love the whole series, The Faithful and the Fallen. But because the narrator, it's just a little slow for my tastes, it, I'm having a hard time getting into it. The story is what drew me, but the narrator is what would either sell it or ruin it, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that almost kind of, it sounds like what you ought to be doing is looking by narrator. <laughs> that is, <laughs> and then that filtering is, by story, which that is, is what true. I do. You look by the narrator and like, what have they done that I would be interested in? Yeah. You know, because if I'm going to spend yeah. the time and I don't probably consume, well, you probably don't consume as many audiobooks as you once did because you probably don't have to drive six hours a day. But <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm really picky about the time I'm going to spend listening to an yeah. audiobook, you know, so I'm I don't just listen to anything. Yeah. The trick is, how do you discover new narrators that you love if you only choose by narrator? Like you have to you have to go somewhere outside. Yeah. that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that's one reason that I have continued to search by book is because sometimes, you know, a, a totally new narrator I've never heard of before may be really good and may put, put on a great show. And then the book that I knew I was going to be interested in becomes twice as good because it's like, this is a great new talent. Sure. But I, I think I think I will take your advice and start looking by narrators more because I know there are a few narrators who have just really sold it for me. Um, Which is what you want to do as a narrator. I mean, you want to yeah. take you want to take that diamond and just present it the best way that you possibly can. You know, it's really rewarding when that works out. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think is cool is that now that we have ACX and people can self publish um, and they can self publish as successfully as they can these days, that I think there's actually more of a chance for you to stumble across a narrator that you might not have heard before that is good because there's just that many more tickets being pulled, right? Yeah. There's that many more opportunities for people who are just starting to break out as an author to individually select a narrator. They're not just going to a publisher who just quickly pulls them from their stable. You have an opportunity where you can say, oh, there's all of this potential up and coming talent. <laughs> this person's great. You, you get the peanut butter and chocolate together and it's fantastic. And that's just an opportunity that you probably didn't have, you know, a decade ago. Interesting. Yeah. I can tell you that I put um, 
I put one book up for auditions, just open <laughs> about a year ago. In 24 hours, I had 50 like applications or responses. Wow. So I'm not surprised at all. There are a lot of narrators out there. And and it was not, I mean, just think if, if you have a, a bigger name, right? Because they get more, more well known every year, but if you have a bigger name and a bigger title, like like you'll have people jumping on that. Um, so there's there are a lot of narrators out there. And uh, you know, you, you just have to figure out which ones are the right talents for your your project, I guess. And it's a lot of work to winnow through you know auditions oh, you know yeah. you get a, so many and taking the time to go through and try and evaluate them i mean there's you're gonna have your first culling we're like yep yeah, nope these are these are not going to work but even just getting it boiled down to a set then you're going to go through and think okay well you know how's this actually going to play out of the course of the series and <laughs> i've done a lot of vo casting for games and in similar in a lot of ways you've got like all these disparate parts and you're throwing them out there and People audition and you're trying to think, okay, well, based on this two sentences that I made you say, how am I going to extrapolate and be <laughs> sure that this is really going to be what the part needs? Yeah. Do you now sort of circling back to the, the idea of you, the narrator, having this sort of sale ability, do you do anything to increase that aside from putting on an awesome show every time you sit down to record? I mean, I try and um, I've done a certain amount of other stuff. You know, sometimes I'll do uh, YouTube videos that intersect with something that's taking off right now. I did some stuff for Will um, because Cradle just like hit big and people wanted more stuff. So um, when uh, the the titles were picked up by Audible, we did like some some reading clips. You know, get on get on the camera in my little booth here and do some reading, and and people people seem to dig that. It's not. I don't think it moves the needle like like for sales that but it's probably it's probably more useful for me <laughs> because yeah. it ties me more publicly to whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, okay. And I like doing that stuff. I enjoy making content and, um, but I don't, I don't know. There's not like a lot of advertising levers to pull apart from that, apart from just being present, interacting with people. Um, sometimes there are Reddit threads. I'll hop in if they have an intersect and I get mentioned and they have a question I'll just try and answer it, you know, be present. Yeah interact with people, be a human being. Don't be a dick. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so like, I mean, us, us as authors that, you know, we can, we obviously say, you know, buy our book kind of stuff, but then the, I, the goal is that we're supposed to connect with readers and all of that through the stories, through whatever, you know, sort of message we are trying to share, whatever messages we perform, promote on our platforms. Do you have something like that? Or is it just kind of, I mean, I have my social media, Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that, but, um, I don't think that a narrator's Facebook page is ever going to be like a big destination, right? Um, <laughs> unless you're maybe Bob Ray. Um, and, and I do it because I want to have that information there and maybe I direct people to it or whatever. Um, I tend to, I think, get more, I have more interactions with people probably on Twitter. Um, and then I'll do, you know, YouTube videos and then I tie them in as best I can. Gotcha. So we've got um, another another question from the audience. When an author is listening to auditions on ACX or Findaway, what sorts of things should they be listening for? What are some good or bad things to watch out for? Either of you guys. Okay, well, I can give you a couple quick ones. One, first, listen to your audio quality. If it sounds like they're recording in a bathroom and they didn't record something decently the first time out, then they probably don't have a reasonable recording setup. So don't assume it's going to improve later. <laughs> Um, and, uh, the other one I would be is just, do they have, is their narrative delivery natural to the kind of book that you wrote? I mean, does it, does this sound like someone that you want reading the narrative stuff of your, of your, of your work? Um, some people are really excellent at character voices, but not excellent at narrative delivery, you know, because they're, they're almost separate skills. Yeah. Um, and some people do great narrative delivery and then stumble with dialogue or the dialogue is not is not they, they just haven't had enough coaching to be good at delivering naturalistic dialogue um and i think it's also the what you want to listen to are people who are not comfortable with their voices enough that they're pushing so hard you can feel them kind of like at the edge of it you know when somebody tries to do like a low deep voice and you can tell that they're like straining to do it <laughs> all the time oh and he was very low and straight because you can't act through that like like uh um, made character choices that they can act through because at the ultimately you want them to act for you 
like Chris Hemsworth in Avengers um, Endgame, where he's trying to talk like Thor. That's that's a pretty good example there. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Or or Christian Bale, all in all the Batman movies. <laughs> that, Batman, that works. Jeff, what about you from the author side of things? Any advice on that? I don't know. I mean, the tips Travis gave were were good. I mean, mo mostly I look for things like you know, can you can you hear the 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 things outside of the the narration and dialogue that you don't want to hear, right? I don't want to if I hear any of that, like Travis said, that's going to be bad. You know, if you hear echo, it's tinny or breaths or whatever it is. Um, so that stuff, uh, like I said, yeah, the before, dog is barking and they didn't bother to remove it. Yeah, that too. <laughs> um, and you know, if you narrow things down to the ones you, you, you like, like I said, look and see whether or not they have, uh, experience in your genre. I think that that's key, you know, like even, even if it's only a, a, a one or two books, you should have some experience in your genre, especially cause this is a fantasy podcast, right? Fantasy is kind of unique like it's a blend of a whole bunch of things in a different world usually and yeah so i'll add one other thing and this is going to sound self-serving but you can go on acx and you can get auditions and you can do your book as a royalty share but whatever book you have narrated for you is going to be stuck on audible for seven years so yeah. just consider that it's part of your author's resume and it costs it costs money to do things that are, are of professional quality. So if you want a portfolio that feels it's of professional quality, be prepared to spend at least some money to do it and budget that money up front. Because if you go in just looking for a free book on on Audible, you're gonna get what you pay for in general. You may have lightning in a bottle with somebody who just happens to be breaking out and is willing to do it for nothing. But most people who have done audiobooks for a while understand that. Anybody who knows they're going to make money on their book on Audible doesn't want to royalty share with you because no. they're going to make money with their book on Audible. So they are going to be they're not even going to want to do royalty share. Um, and that the people who are looking for royalty share generally aren't confident in the performance of their book. So it's not generally a good bet. So if you've been down the road for a while, you know that somebody who can't afford to do it and doesn't think they will be able to afford to do it is maybe not confident in their book. And its performance but they've seen how it's selling on on amazon and they're like yeah i sold 10 copies last month i'm sure it'll audible will help it pick up it's not gonna because the book comes first um anyway so be save some money and be prepared to spend a little money to get somebody who's going to do your book justice because you're going to want to be proud of it and look back at it and say i'm really glad i did this seven years from now right and and it's fine if it's going to take like six or nine months before you know you break even and then you start making money but you just have to understand that's an investment and you're investing for years, not for, you know, the next 30 days or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, if you do royalty share, guess what? The narrator basically holds your rights as well as you, and you can't do anything with that book. Um, you can't take it down or anything unless the narrator agrees to it. Yeah. You were and both seven years. So co-rights holders on the audio effectively. So yeah, yep. exactly. Interesting. Um, another question from the audience. This was probably more for you, Travis. How important is it to match the narrator's gender to the protagonist? I'm guessing that means sort of the the driving force, the narrative voice, um, specifically in a fantasy series where the protagonist spotlight changes to characters with different genders in each book. Um, to me, I think that really gets down to whether it's first person or third person. If it's first person, I think the ideal is that you want the the narrator to be of the gender of the protagonist. Um, if you're in a book that has shifting perspectives, I mean, this happens a lot in romance, you'll have dual narration where there's a primary male POV and a primary female POV, and they'll they'll do dual narration where you have a male and female narrators doing those parts. Um, if you're just shifting POVs and it's still third person, um, I think you're probably just looking for the, the dominant tone or just a voice that you want for the narrative of your book. Because, I mean, I've done plenty of female POV, but it's not first person POV. You know? Oh, it's, it's third person. It's third person, but, okay. from the, for, but following this female character. And that's, you've already got to do their voices, right? You've already got to be able to deliver, you know, reasonably convincingly as this female character. So that would be my take on it. Yeah. How, how easy or hard is it for you to do like a convincing feminine character? <laughs> I don't know if I can speak to its convincingness, but <laughs> I, um, 
I'm sure I don't sound like a woman. And I mean, the goal is not to sound falsetto. It's to sound genuine and like you're a real person and to cut the bass a little bit and just lighten the voice up a little bit, give it a little bit of a, there's a little bit more musicality to feminine voices as you're delivering them. And you're just, you're just, you're just getting that distinction. It's obviously not the male. And when you add in accents and age, you get kind of a, a range there, but um, I wouldn't, if it's a third person POV, obviously deliver the narrative in that character's voice because they aren't, they aren't the narrator, right? Yeah. So you're still using your voice for the bulk of the narration as long as it's third person. Yeah, I would agree. Like if, you, if it's third person, I think, and you have multiple, you know, sexes for POVs, then think about if you'd rather have a male voice as the narration, right? Not, not, not the dialogue, but like everything else, right? Do you want a male storyteller or a female? Because that's going to just kind of paint the rest of the book that's outside of the dialogue. I mean, if yeah. it was a third person book that is all about a female character, I mean, I would, I would say yeah. it's a okay. benefit to get a female narrator. Agreed. Um, if you got the POV switch, maybe look at the dominant POV. Do you still, I mean, usually there seems to be like a primary and then there's <laughs> like a secondary or tertiary POV. Um, and I'd probably lean toward the primary POV, but. Interesting. Now, now going uh, playing with the voices a little bit, which one is the easiest for you to do? Which one do you enjoy the most and which is the hardest and least enjoyable? As far as voices? Yeah. Like, or I mean, like accents, regionalisms, characters, like every, everything. What is your most and least favorite to do? Oh man. I really like doing little old ladies. Little old ladies <laughs> are actually hysterical and they're almost always written with something funny to say. They get just like some Betty White element to like little okay. old lady characters. They're always really enjoyable. Quirky. Um, <laughs> I like in general, I like big fantasy characters because I love just kind of like the, I don't want to say cartooniness of them, but they're big. You know, they're, yeah. they're fun to really, so like in, in Will White's uh, Pradle series, there's the, there's Orthos, who's a like three ton turtle who's on fire and he's fantastic <laughs> to voice. Who doesn't want to voice a three ton turtle on fire? So I love doing characters like that. Um, uh, a lot of it just really gets down to the kind of dialogue though. Okay. My favorite characters are almost always the ones who have the coolest lines. <laughs> and ideally you back it up with a cool enough voice that it all sounds great, but um. I th I'm going to say my favorite characters are, yeah, old ladies and burning turtles. Burning turtles. It's just uh, big guys. They they kind of they kind of have more to them. They're louder. They're they're out there, and you can play with that in a way that I think in in normal society you can't really be that kind of character. Um, other characters I really like are are they're always going to be kind of like your uh, your comic relief characters are almost always mm -hmm. a ton of fun to do because they usually have again really great lines. And it's fun to get the comic timing nailed so that the joke pulls off just right. It's very satisfying to do, <laughs> especially if you get to do a weird voice while you're doing it. Um. That's true. <laughs> now, what about what about the hardest and your least favorite voices? Um, the hardest voices are almost always the ones where there's like a ton of characters that have no actually information about them, but okay. they need to be distinguished. So for me, that's always the biggest challenge. So I had one book, which was a good book, um, but there were 75 female speaking parts and Whoa. two male speaking parts. But it was a male POV book. Um, it was a it was like wow. a world where where basically almost no men were born. But most of those characters had like a name and that was it. And there would be like five <laughs> yeah. of them in a room having a conversation and to a certain extent, I'm just having to invent some character trait and try and keep track of it so that I can make these conversations function and have these characters be identifiable when I know nothing about them. So for me, yeah. that's the most challenging thing is taking <clears throat> characters that don't have distinguishing elements and making them distinguishable without using some too much dramatic license for the author's work. Because I don't want to corrupt what they're trying to do. I don't want to make this person like Irish if they aren't. You know, I want to yeah. I want I want to respect what the author's doing, but still have the listener be able to tell what the hell is going on. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. You know, as an author, you realize that, you know, you you have like these throwaway characters that you encounter all along the way. You you don't want to take a lot of time to paint too much around them. So yeah. you don't think about that. Oh, I don't need much depth to this person. They just say something and they disappear or whatever. Yeah. So 
never and considered. In a lot of cases, it doesn't matter. You know, okay, I'm only going to have this person for a paragraph. All they got to do is say something at the end on the way down the road. It's no big deal. And those aren't too bad. You pick, you pick kind of like from your your B squad of character voices, and you just <laughs> assign a few in there so that you keep all your 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 heavy artillery for your mains, right? Um, it's it's mostly when there's a bunch of them that it's the hardest, because. It, <laughs> who are they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, you were talking about uh, sort of trying to keep track of the characters. Do you, how do you do that? How do you keep track of the accents that you've done or the, the mannerisms? Do you have a document? Do you have, a, you know, a folder with, you know, select wave files from the voices? How do you do it? So I do it two ways. It depends on how well known they are. So I have effectively a stable of character actors in my head that I can assign to things. And I can drop into those characters generally relatively quickly, you know, shaped to whatever the narrative requires, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a certain number that, that just aren't in my stable. And for those that I can immediately recall, I will always take a first voice sample, name it, have it ready to go. And when they come up 12 chapters later, I'll go look them up, listen to it again, say those lines out loud, get back in the headspace and then go. Usually when I do a book, I do effectively a movie cast. Not okay. because I'm going to like imitate these people, but I will assign like actors that I know with an IMDb link. This is who I would imagine in the movie version. This person, this person, this person. <laughs> and that's like a touchstone for me when I'm going through. Oh, this is the guy that sounds like, you know, uh, whoever. Yeah. Uh, Peter Stormare, for instance. I need that, that. This is that Eastern European guy. I'm just, let me think about yeah. Peter Stormare for a second. <laughs> Gotcha. It kind of gets you in there. Okay, so you, be, right now, I would love to see the the care the IMDb list from like my books <laughs> that you I, I sent you a couple for the first one for when we did uh, when we did um, uh, uh, the first novella. Oh, when we were talking yeah. about uh, uh, because it was it was uh, the actor from Game of Thrones who plays uh, he plays Jamie's friend sort of friend who's yeah. always you know he's always basically being enticed with getting a castle and whatever <laughs> oh braun oh yeah he's yeah, awesome Ron. yeah exactly that that actor oh. was uh was uh was one of them that i think i mentioned um anyway yeah yeah i forgot i forgot about that yeah because he was your the, your version for brogan exactly exactly yeah. whatever yeah that's pretty cool. cool now do you do you ever hear voices in your head and realize oh shit i'm doing this character like this actor too much and kind of pull back or do you just kind of like lean into whatever comes to your head right off and just go with it um i mean i think maybe early on these days i'm, I'm a little bit more i usually know what i'm gonna do there's a few times where i'll have a character that's really weird that i'll have to experiment with because you just don't know how it should sound and it's usually a really important character that's got something very unique about it you know um uh, in Will's Unsold series, there's a character named Yaren who has an unplaceable accent and uses a lots of really weird idioms. And she's not from anywhere. And so we spent a while trying to figure out what on earth her accent was and how would it, just trying to figure out what kind of character she was because it was, who is that? <laughs> um, and eventually we ended up with Gal Gadot from Wonder Woman because it's like this weird sort of Israeli accent. Yeah, it's not yeah. terribly placeable. If you didn't know she was from Israel, you wouldn't know where her accent comes from. But it sounds a little bit exotic. And so we ended up doing that. Interesting. Oh, I had I had a really good question leading off of that, but I t it totally slipped my mind. I got sucked into that. <laughs> um. Yeah, so I totally forgot. Okay, here's a question from the audience to save my ass. <laughs> Does Travis have any advice for non-human characters? Does he have a dragon voice? Go with the oh yeah, I got a couple dragon voice. voices. Oh, do the I dragon got a voice. Dragon then. voices. So Orthos is, uses one of my dragon voices. Orthos is very low, and you have a certain <laughs> amount of gravel and depth, and you usually work the proximity of the mic to get a little bit more heaviness into it. And then sometimes you get your female dragons and usually they have kind of a little bit of British to them, you know, but again, some of that depth sort of husky, husky and British, and you bring it close and there's a little bit of sibilance on the end and you kind of let the, you let them things ride out a little bit, but you try and have things resonate in your chest and have them sound bigger. But I guess it depends on the kind of dragon. Usually they're kind of like smart and, you know, yeah. old. And so you want that sort of like ancient feeling to them. 
That's pretty cool. I bet I bet like taking a video of you doing the voices would be very, very entertaining. Oh, I've got one on my YouTube. I did one for all the cradle voices. So if you want to see the worst oh, yeah? faces ever, it's really just hysterically terrible. I am now I am now going to look that up. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I, for me, a lot of it's really physical. So I think for a lot, especially if you're doing big voices like that, it's a lot of it is physical. And I mean, your mouth is an instrument and the shape of it on how you let it sit and how you let your mouth open and round. You do a lot. You just kind of learn to use that instrument in ways that, you know, it's not normally That's pretty used. cool. And like I like guess I mean karaoke. Yeah. <laughs> so like when you do big voices, you could, you tend to like make your your cheeks puff. You want a more cavernous space. That's pretty cool. That is cool. <laughs> do you ever do falsetto? Like for the for for a character, and then sort of lean into that, or do you stay yeah, away from falsetto? I have done a falsetto, but it was for a comic character who was like a little imp dude who sounded specifically falsetto and okay. funny. So he had a very you know high voice. <laughs> uh, also, we could just never, have it. never for women. Never for women. It sounds just horrible, and everybody loathes it, and I'm embarrassed. Unless you're doing the the Dame Maggie Smith voice, in which case you need that that sort of crackly falsetto. <laughs> Even Maggie Smith, she's got a lot of she's got a lot of husk and rasp to her yeah. voice, you know. Um. <laughs> That's pretty fun. All right, um, and then I guess the question was for non-human characters. Let's say, um, okay, in my book, for example, there's demons, right? Sure. And so there's demons that are like, you know, 15 foot tall monsters. And then there's like a voice in his head. How would you approach those two? I'm guessing the big one would be kind of growly and stony like the dragon. Yes. Essentially. And, and mostly it's just making sure that you can be heard when you do it. If you don't push it yeah. so far that the words become unintelligible. Okay. And um, then how do you approach like, let's say telepathic communication or things that are like only inside the head? Um, if they're only inside the head, um, a lot of times you use a proximity effect and you kind of, there's kind of like a downward slope to it. So I'm saying something and then I'm saying it inside my head. You have like, uh -huh. you're using these kind of like, you're kind of ducking under a little bit and you're just trying to provide that separation. And there's a certain like, um, I don't want to say echoey quality, but like internal quality that you can do by softening some of the bass in your voice and tilting downward and getting a little bit of extra proximity. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to go overboard and I'm kind of like over illustrating for the purposes of showing you what I mean, but. Uh, nope. There's, you you run into internalized thought all the time in in books, so you just kind of have your kind of go to way to do it. Interesting, it's cool. That's pretty cool. cool. Well, now let's see. This this might be an imposition, but one of the the viewers says, "I want to hear him do voices for a male griffin and a female dragon, arguing which is the better species." I need a script. I need a script. <laughs> all right, Jeff, you're the writer. <laughs> Write something for him real fast. <laughs> okay, I. I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I figured I figured that's it's too much to ask on the show. But male dragons are clearly the superior species. <laughs> and then you have what? It was a female griffin. Female griffin. Female. female griffin. Clearly, the female griffin is the most exceptional beast. I don't know. Oh man! Very, 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 very good. You do that stuff. I know. <laughs> I want to write a character now, just to see, just to throw something super weird at you to see how you do it. <laughs> what I think is weird is that you. I end up moving my head a lot. Yeah, and it's almost, but it's on purpose. It's just you. You don't. You don't know you're doing it because your voice changes as you pass. Yeah. So there's this weird, um, like live quality you get to dialogue because when you're talking to somebody, they're usually not static. They're not standing there talking to you like this. There's gestures and things happening. So it adds this weird organic quality to the delivery that makes it feel more live, but it makes you look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, truthfully, I do believe that's what, what people like is, is when they kind of take a look behind the scenes and they see just how ridiculous some of these things are. I've done, oh I've God. done, you know, the live readings and people are like, holy shit, that's so stupid. Oh but God. it's so funny because you're making a fool out of yourself and people like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm good at making a fool of, out of myself, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. All right. Well, so we're we're pretty much running out of time. Jeff, is there anything you want to add on the whole audiobook conversation? Uh, oh, actually, I'll add one thing. So if somebody wants to check out Travis's work for, for free, 
you can go if you go to oddfans.com uh i have a novella and it's like uh, i don't know maybe an hour long a little bit more than an hour you get to listen to uh to him do his thing and it's a fun little story the uh the novella is titled wizardums it's like a kingdom but with wizards uh legend of shadowmar and uh yeah download it, it, it out for free and, nice contained yeah. story no cliffhanger yeah, yeah. So I, I just I just heard about Odd Fans in the last couple of months, and they have a lot of like free Audible. I mean, audio books, like usually short stories, novellas, things like that to download. But it's sort of a way of of giving free stuff because Audible doesn't allow freebies, right? Right, exactly. But in this way, you get to kind of like test out, you know, an author and a narrator at the same time for free. Easy. That's pretty. It's gonna cool. sound way better than those crummy little samples you get on Audible that sound like. I don't know. They're, they're like so compressed. You this little gritty. It's like you're listening through a stethoscope. To the... <laughs> yeah, and it's what, like a couple, a few minutes, three minutes or something. You, yeah. You don't get any feeling for scope or um, different settings and di you know um, voices. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, did, so I guess Travis, you had to learn a little bit about audio mixing and and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, there's compared to like what people have to do for music or real audio production, it's a lot. There's a lot less. Um, okay. But yeah. Yeah, but I already I had to do a lot of this for game audio already, so I already had a certain amount of knowledge about how to set up and do this. Although I learned a lot because doing audiobooks is way less forgiving because it's not in an audio mix with other things. You're just listening to somebody <laughs> and yeah. the dogs and the garbage truck and the airplanes and you know whatever else. How much time does it take you to produce a finished hour of audio? It really depends on the language and how much dialogue and how difficult the dialogue is. Some okay. authors are like real rat-a-tat, really brief sentences that are very easy to roll off. And some people have like, you know, the page and a half paragraph and you're trying to figure out where to breathe. Yeah. Um, if the complexity of the language is high, I'm more likely to mess up. Um, so it's anywhere from probably for an hour, it's probably an hour and a half to two hours for me at this okay. point, usually. Um, Does that include the like the mixing and you know cutting out the breath sounds and the background and things like so that? So I use punch and roll. So that includes me basically. I mess up. I go back. It rolls in, and I've got I've got clean audio at the end of it. So it just needs to be mastered, which is not okay. over difficult. There's still proofing. Somebody else still has to listen to it, but that's not part of my initial production of that hour of audio. I do that yeah. all at the end. I pay my proofer to go through and make sure I didn't mess up. Oh wow. You work with someone who who proof listens, I guess, to your yeah. audio. And everybody, okay. as far as I know, anybody doing this professionally does. You've got to proof. Oh. You, you can't listen to it yourself for the same reason that authors don't pay themselves to proofread their own work. You just, <laughs> you don't know what's wrong. Or, yeah. you know, you've seen it so many times, you know what it's supposed to be. <clears throat> the same thing is true for narrators. Interesting. Yeah. So then by the time it actually gets to the 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 author, it's as clean as, 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 clean as possible. Yeah, um, it should be clean meeting all the specs of uh, have nicely mastered audio and it should have all the all errors removed. Obviously sometimes errors still get through for the same way that they do in a manuscript. You know, sometimes yeah. you've been through four proofs on a manuscript and you've still got something that went wrong. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. But ideally the bulk of it is fixed and this is going to be a nice solid nice solid audio book. That was actually the question I was going to ask you earlier is how do you like make sure the author is happy with like that you that you communicate with the author, you know, okay, here's kind of what I'm thinking for this voice or or that do you have sort of like a sheet that you ask authors to fill out, you know, to give you characteristics of each of the characters or how do you do that? It depends on the book and the characters and and how where I even have contact with the author because a lot of times I don't. The okay. publisher just says, here's the book. If you have any questions, ask us, we'll ask them and then get them back to you. Um, so for all Jeff st stuff, for instance, uh, especially for the first book, we did way more prep for the first book. I had a huge yeah. list of pronunciation checks and I actually read them all out loud so that he could listen to my pronunciations to make sure that I hadn't fumbled them. And you kind of get a sense for how authors tend to pronounce things. There's yeah. just like, there's just phonetic rules for how they have chosen to name things. So once you kind of get the baseline, it's a lot easier to just write <clears throat> out how I phonetically think it should be read and then ask. Um, in general, I try not to overload authors with character questions unless okay. they're um, unless it's really early on, like we did with the first Wizardom's book. I wanted to kind of make sure I got the tone. Like, do you want kind of like an American delivery for this? How 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 casual is this? How formal? And just to get any, it gives them an opportunity to say this is really important to me <laughs> up front <laughs> because I want to know up front because after you've recorded, 
10 or 12 hours of audio, it's a terrible time to find out that yeah. I really wish that person had, had like an Irish lilt. Yeah. Um, so for the main characters, like, do, have you ever gone back and had to edit some of the minor characters because the accents weren't quite right or the voices weren't quite right? Or is it kind of just like, leave it and done? No, I don't think I've had to do that. Um, the only time I've had to go back and do a big edit was for a pronunciation change that we had all approved, but that listeners didn't like. Oh. And we decided to change it. Um, in general, I try to just make sure that it's it's set ahead of time. You know, I will, if there's any question, I'll just ask the author again. You know, okay. because I don't want to I don't want to commit it to audio if it's not what they want. And obviously there's a there's a degree of interpretation and some authors are going to be more they're want going to want to be more hands on or have more influence beyond a certain point. I mean, I can only sound like what I can make things sound like. Yeah, so it's really more down to like character choice. You know, is this person <clears throat> a funny character? Is they Are they flirty? Are they have I somehow got the wrong read of their character? But in general, the author has put all that information in the book. If I've read it, and I should have, then I should know what, who that character is, and I should hopefully be able to evoke it as best I can. So do you do a complete read-through before you start recording it? Got to. Got to. Okay. Otherwise, you do find out on page 472 that they've had an accent this whole time. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or actually, you know, they lisp. They lisp, you know? And sometimes that happens in series. Like, you'll start with a series, and there'll be some minor character they're in like two scenes and you know very little about them. And then four books later, all of a sudden they're the main antagonist and you discover that they have a growly voice. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. It's nice if you, if you, uh, if you know that's going to happen. And sometimes I'll, I'll try and remember to ask ahead of time, if there are any characters that become more important later, I would love mm. to know because yeah. I'll make my initial list and it's clear who the mains are, but if it's a long series, that's not always going to follow through. Gotcha. Gotcha. That is awesome. Well, Travis, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of this with us. This has been super interesting. Um, I guess tell our readers, listeners, viewers, watchers, podcasters, where they can find you and what books you would recommend they start listening to to get a sense of you as the narrator. Um, well, you can find me on Audible and search for Travis Baldry. I'll be right there. Um, obviously, listen to Jeff's work. Um, and there's a, the second Wizardom's book, I think, is coming out. It yeah, it just came out and the end of last week. Yeah, it just came out like a week ago. Yeah, yeah. Fr um, Friday, I think you were, or Thursday or Friday was live on Audible. Or on, and then the yeah, third right. will be coming out probably, probably early February, late January or something. Is that, is right. that a secret? Did I just say a bad thing? No, that's not a secret. The okay. Third one is in, in <laughs> okay. January. Hopefully, the audio book is around that time, but you don't know. Um, uh, the Cradle series is probably what I'm most well known for. Will White stuff, and uh, those are a ton of fun. They'll be right there at the top of the list. Um, and uh, yeah, at the top of literally every list everywhere, yeah. really. <laughs> audible getting out and pushing on, all, all yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, <laughs> they, I think it, it got the ebook got up to like number five in the whole Amazon store, yeah. It's yeah. just like, and I think the ones ahead of it were all those like freebies that auto, that Amazon promotes, so they're yeah. always at the top of the list because nobody yeah. has to buy them, yeah. That makes sense. That's awesome. And I guess Jeff might as well tell people where they can find you too. <laughs> okay. Uh, my, my website is Jeffrey L And that's K O H A N E K. Um, I'm on Facebook way more often than I should be. Uh, <laughs> those two places. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can also see the spelling. And again, that's, this is the first book of the wizard of series. Um, and you can get it on audible with, Travis's wonderful narration. Very, very cool. And of course, guys, do check out oddfans.com to check out the freebie as well. Download that and get a taste of it. It sounds awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming on. Super appreciate having you. Thanks for having us. Yep. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. And for all those who are regulars of the Fantasy Fiends podcast, tomorrow night will be our regularly scheduled program with S.A. last name that I'm going to totally butcher, something like Kloffenstein, which is just way too hard for me to figure out. But it's going to S.A. something. We're going to be talking fantasy. So tune in tomorrow night. Have a great day. Thank you. This is the.